Great, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, thanks to Norwegian government for, for helping to organize with, with Mona and KLP. Um, this is an exciting uh, time for us now, and I'm happy to be talking to you a little bit about um, the milestone for us that is the Dodd-Frank Act. I think um, Raymond really put it really well, is that we should be looking at the Dodd-Frank Act as a minimum standard. It, it sort of, it, it opens a door for us and, and lets us look further and I'm really happy to see, we're really happy to see from the U.S. how much further Norway and the EU is thinking about country, country by country reporting. Um, so just a quick overview of, of, of who we are. Um, uh, so I'm the director of the, the U.S. chapter of Publish What You Pay, which is a quick reminder, um, it's a global coalition founded in 2002. We've got about 600 NGOs working in over almost <coughs> 70 countries. Um, and our goal, the reason why we were launched, was mandatory reporting in the extractive industries, really, as our name says, getting companies to publish what they pay to governments. Quite a narrow ask. Um, and, and that ask has evolved over time, depending on our membership and et cetera. In the US, um, we're founded in 2004, so just a couple years after the global, um, the global call, global campaign was launched. Uh, we've got 33 organizations, about 2.5 million citizens that create sort of our grassroots networks and give us our credibility and our mandate. Um, and we've been working um, since about uh, 2005 uh, on the, the, the Card and Luger provision. Um, and I'll just go a little bit through, through the, um, the background there. I think the, the speakers before me more or less covered um, generally what the, what the law covers. Um, but um, in terms of what we won for the United States, and I'm sure all of you can imagine, I think you're somewhat familiar with, with our political process. It's not the prettiest thing. Um, <laughs> That for us, this was really a landmark achievement, um, and, 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 and definitely in global regulation. We think that this has actually set the stage uh, and allowed a, a global response and actually made us go further, which is really fantastic. Um, it's the first time we're going to see consistent, timely, and reliable data in this sector. What we're having problems with in this sector right now is that data is being published through EITI. It's fantastic. We're a big supporter, invested from the very beginning, but that data is not necessarily consistent. It's not comparable across countries, so there's some gaps there. Um, for us, it's a new tool to empower citizens, our civil society members um, like Oxfam that have uh, offices in other countries. They need this data to empower the communities that they work with. Um, and, and as I said, it complements and strengthen, strengthens the EITI. It goes to places where the EITI can't reach. So in terms of why the U.S. acted, um, I think um, f from the legislator's perspective, there was a few reasons. So principally, um, in, at the, in the time that we were, we were uh, pushing on this bill, um, it's U.S. energy security. We're, we're reaching a financial crisis. We're in two wars. Um, you know, U.S. energy supplies are, are, are less and less secure. Um, and, and really, our legislators are hearing that from their constituencies. So that was actually quite important for the U.S was how was transparency going to it stabilize U.S. energy supply countries. Also investor protection. Um, again, um, we are in, we're in a financial crisis around 2007, 2008, 2009 when this was being discussed. These are the messages that, that our legislators are hearing that um, we need to stabilize energy markets to increase investment. Again, increase um, the stability of U.S. energy supply. Also good governance and democracy um, for all the reasons I think that, that we discussed here. And then the idea that more stable investment climate uh, leads to, to, to growth and then to poverty alleviation. So in terms of what companies are covered, um, as, as mentioned already, so companies that are listed on U.S. stock exchanges, uh, new uh, research is coming out from Revenue Watch um, very soon, stay tuned. Um, the figure we've got there is that, that these companies comprise about 40% of the, the, the total sector's uh, value. Um, uh, these are companies that the trigger is that the company should file an annual report with the SEC. So the trigger is not that they're categorized as an oil, gas, or mining company, it's that they file an annual report. Um, and that they make payments to government for what's called the commercial development of oil, gas, and minerals. And this covers subsidiaries and entities under the control of these companies. And that remains to be interpreted by the SEC. And as Bennett said in his video, the SEC estimates that it'll cover about 1,100 companies. Uh, some of those are categorized as oil, gas, and mining companies. Um, but I, I believe that about 500, some of, of those are actually categorized as oil, gas, and mining companies, and the rest are contractor service companies like a Halliburton, et cetera. Um, so the payments that should be reported um, as you know, it's, it's payments by country, by project, and it covers, specifically the legislation covers taxes, royalties, fees, production, entitlements, and bonuses. Those are specifically included within the legislation. 
And then the SEC has some discretion on defining other payments in line with the ITI and part of what's called the commonly recognized revenue stream. Again, it needs to interpret that term as well. Uh, so when and how will the reporting be done? So companies have one fiscal year after the rules are issued to get their act together and then report in the following fiscal year. Um, they'll publish it in their annual report and they must tag this information electronically. Um, so right now the, the SEC is using a, a format called XBRL that is trying to introduce. So essentially it allows you to uh, create data aggregating websites that can pull this information. So, so the law specifies these different tags that the, that the issuers need to, to uh, tag their data with. Then, then the SEC has to create a public compilation of all of the reports from these companies and put it out um, every year. Um, so a bit of the rationale behind why these categories were included. So the country by country reporting of those payments that were specified, obviously, I think we all, I think pretty familiar here. Um, this is EITI best practice. This is the disaggregated reporting that happens within EITI and we wanted to enshrine this in, in, in the law. Um, also, we hope that this would improve EITI standards in countries that don't disaggregate um, their reporting and then obviously helping with budget public budget reconciliation. And on the project by project, um, there, there's three key reasons why project reporting was important and why, why we believed it needed to be in this legislation. Um, and, and this actually comes from the work of, of the Publish What You Pay US coalition partners in the field. So one is that there's community demand. Many times communities bear the greatest impact of extractive industries, right? So there's, so what you're seeing here is Oxfam has a campaign called the right to know, the right to decide. Um, this is in Peru. It's, um, it's a community consultation around a project. I think we can't discount how actually educated and politi politically aware um, communities are about projects. They actually want to know how much the project down the street is generating because they want to compare that to the environmental and social impacts that they're feeling to begin to raise questions about is, 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 does this benefit outweigh the impact that, that my, my children and my grandchildren will feel. Um, and also, because of that, they want to hold the government um, accountable, both local and, and national. There's actually quite a bit of local government demand as well. Um, in many of these resource-rich states, we have the central government distributing funds to local <coughs> governments. So central, central government collects the funds from the extractive projects, redistributes them to the local government. Local governments want to hold the national government accountable for both the amount that they're receiving, they want to make sure they're receiving as much as they're supposed to be receiving according to the law, and also they want to make sure that they're, they're getting the support they need for mitigating the impacts and the conflicts. Uh, many times, local governments will be the first in line to deal with a community conflict, environmental and social disasters. Um, so they're actually managing a lot. Um, they'll also be in charge of delivering benefits most of the time. Um, and what's important to keep in mind in many of these countries is that the transfer systems between the national government and the local governments vary widely in their fairness, transparency, and, and efficiency. So, so many of us, many of our coalition members, really work on national government policies. But there's, a, 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 there's problems at the subnational level as well. Um, and and these, these problems play out quite a bit in Peru. And I did, a, in my previous incarnation, my old job, work with Oxfam quite a bit in looking at those systems. So national, national fiscal administration debates happening in many of these countries, some of them supported by IMF and World Bank, are really looking at are the allocation systems for the revenues within this country, are they fair? Uh, do they work? Are they accountable? And having information about how much each project is generating within a jurisdiction can help to create those, those accountability systems and it can help to feed these debates. Um, and then again, investor protection. Um, risk profiles are, are, are different depending on a jurisdiction, right? The different states in Nigeria have different risk profiles. I don't think, I think people are probably comfortable with that. Um, the status of the regulations. So the draft regulations came out in December 2010 by the SEC. There was an open comment period and there still is an open comment period that, that, that I invite you to, to submit a letter into. Um, the, the formal comment period closed in March. Um, and the final rules were supposed to be out in April of this year, but have been delayed. And the time frame that they've given us is August, December 2011. And we understand, um, had a phone call with them um, last week, that they're aiming for August. Um, so we're happy that the draft uh, regulations, um, you can find online, um, happy to share with you as well, um, includes some publish what you pay recommendations which is great. Um, and uh, we're really happy to see that the investors are quite supportive. Um, investors with assets under man management, about 1.2 trillion uh, submitted comments that were, that were quite supportive. Um, 
then just wanted to go over some of the key interpretational issues, and I can go into detail maybe in the afternoon um, a little bit more on, on some of these, depending on what folks are interested in. There's an issue around exemptions. The, pro the rule proposal uh, does not um, provide exemptions for any type of company for any category. Um, there is uh, exemptions requested from companies for foreign issuers that will have to report in other markets. Also exemptions um, for conflicts of laws and issues with confidentiality clauses and contracts. Um, now, it, it should be noted that securities laws in the US have lots of remedies already existing. Um, so these are, this is a specific exemption request to be written into these regulations. We don't believe that's necessary. We think that there's plenty of remedies already available. Um, also, the definition of project, how you actually define that. There's differing um, opinions on that. We believe it should be a lease and license level. Companies are proposing a, a, that a project should be defined as all activities in a country. I think we're in disagreement with that. Um, also, reporting liability. What happens if a company misreports uh, willfully or not willfully? Um, so there's questions around that. Um, what additional payment categories should be included? Uh, In-kind payments were proposed by the SEC. Uh, also, dividends were also proposed by the SEC. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see what, what remains in the final rules. Uh, should upstream and downstream payments, upstream or downstream payments, be included? Right now, the, the proposed rules focus on upstream, um, and, 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 and we're okay with that. Um, also, how should joint ventures be treated? Should there be proportional reporting? Um, and then finally, um, there's been an ask by some industry that the reports of the companies be kept, be kept confidential, and that the public compilation by the SEC, that that be the only document that's provided to the public. Right, which would, which would be highly problematic and go against the intent of the law. Um, so, um, so we're really happy that this got a lot of press, obviously. We're, we're actually happy about the impact in the US um, not only in, in other countries. Um, a, as some of you may know, our, our extractive sector in the U.S. has had just a few problems in the past few years, quite a few scandals. Um, so for us, the, the reporting actually to the federal government, payments to our federal government, will actually be quite useful. Um, um, so what's next? Um, for us, we're, we're getting ready to see these, these reports come out. Um, because of the delay, we, it could be the, the reports could come out, um, I think the earliest we're going to see them is 2013, at the very earliest. Um, what we want to try to do as a coalition, and we're, we're, we're stepping back to think about how we do this, is to begin to fill EITI gaps, the countries that aren't covered. How can we use this information to get countries to join EITI um, and establish the, the, the groundwork for more transparency in countries that may not ever sign up? Libya, Cambodia, Burma, et cetera, um, and thereby strengthening EITI in countries where, that have implemented the standard, uh, and then promote a global standard with Dodd-Frank as a minimum. Um, I think clearly from what we've seen today, it has to be a minimum. Um, that was as far as the U.S. was going to go. The, 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 the tax justice ask, and, and, and uh, GFI joined our coalition maybe about a year or two ago, and so, so really helped in the U.S., helped us begin to think about the broader the broader tax issues within the sector and, and this broader ask that's, that's being pushed by, by Publishers You Pay Norway, um, the U.S. just wasn't ready to go there uh, when, we were, when we were pushing. Um, and, and actually those asks weren't, weren't, a part of our, um, weren't a part of our campaign when we started. Um, so what's next in terms of the, the debates? Um, we absolutely need to advocate for listing regulations as a, as a minimum, uh, the, with Dodd-Frank as a minimum standard in other, in other markets. Um, and there's quite a bit of work going on. Uh, Revenue Watch is leading a bit of that. We've got Publish What You Pay in Canada working. Um, th there's lots, lots of movement, um, and I think that this forum is an important step forward. And I'll leave it there. Thank you.